presentation. So here is Dan Davidson with his presentation, Development and Assessment of Cultural Competence as a Function of Overall Language Proficiency. Thank you. I want to just add my uh, note of gratitude to the organizers of this conference. This is uh, a, a very remarkable confluence of uh, uh, institutions and individual scholars and programs uh, talking about an, an issue that probably has never been so important as it is right now in terms of policy decisions that are being made and in terms of really the future of the way Americans are going to either will or won't study language, foreign languages in the, in the years ahead. Um, I uh, wanted to, uh, just by way of, uh, of background, uh, remind you of, uh, of a personality who, a contemporary of Delheim's, who's been mentioned uh, repeatedly in the sections today, uh, and that man was Richard, uh, and is Richard Lampert, whose name some of you will know, the University of Pennsylvania uh, sociologist who went on to found the National Foreign Language Center in the 1980s. And uh, I, rec I will always remember my first uh, collision, shall we say, encounter with Dick Lambert, uh, who was not known to wear kid gloves and had no stake whatsoever in our field in any method uh, or in any approach, but he did care deeply about the quality of education in the United States and about foreign language education. And he often said to me, Dan, I think you all are uh, people in foreign language are your own worst enemies. You, you're not a very strong advocate for what, what, what in fact your field needs. And uh, Dick, uh, the empiricist, uh, said that until you can, uh, as a field, can put solid data uh, out there, uh, that uh, describes uh, what the outcomes of your programs are, uh, what the alleged value added is for overseas study, uh, when, it, when the overseas uh, component makes most sense in a language learning career, you're going to have a lot of difficulty getting your supporters on campuses and school districts and in the federal and state governments to take you seriously. Uh, he challenged us to do that, and the uh, first uh, uh, outcome was uh, something called the predictors of gain during study abroad, which is the first very large-scale, multi-institutional, macro study of language outcomes in which we made an attempt at that point to lay out what is the, uh, what is the expected outcome of a, an individual who goes overseas for a semester, a summer, or an academic year uh, at X level of initial proficiency and coming out at what at Y level at the end. Um, in other words, a kind of a John Carroll approach to overseas study. Uh, my most recent piece in that series came out in foreign language annals in 2010. Uh, it's an update of the predictor's study. Uh, the size of the N at that point was 1,880 student learning careers collected over 15 years. Uh, and focused entirely in that study on the study on, on, on Russian, on the acquisition of Russian. And uh, there we were able to look at the impact of academic year, uh, summer, and uh, semester length study at a whole variety of different initial starting points. Uh, what we learned from that study uh, is that you can predict, and you'll see some of the, the uh, uh, information here today related to the current uh, populations, uh, we can, with a certain amount of certainty, uh, state what we would expect to happen uh, with a student who's had three years of foreign language in the United States, uh, has achieved, let's say, intermediate mid, or intermediate high, if it's a less commonly taught language, it's probably intermediate low, uh, but somewhere in the intermediate range. And what would be the value added, to use Lambert's phrase, if you go for a semester, you go for a summer, you go for a year. Those are very different nonlinear uh, relations that appear at that point. And uh, this, I think, has been helpful. Uh, what I want to go on to say, and uh, uh, echoing what Celeste uh, has said earlier today, and Heidi has said at the beginning of our meeting, um, what we cannot, we can account through the measurement of linguistic variables, such as reading proficiency, listening proficiency, grammar control, uh, uh, and uh, we can uh, predict and account for something like 37 or 38 percent of the total variation that occurs. Uh, if you take into account certain behavioral uh, variables that can also be classified, measured, and followed, we can actually raise the model strength, the R squared, as it were, to something around 50, 51, or 52, 
may be 57. In Everett Alontra's research, she made 59 by doing it the right way and looking at self-correction behavior as one of those behaviors. But uh, basically, uh, you see we're kind of moving right now in terms of where is the field and its ability to, to predict these things. We're somewhere between 30 and 50 percent, uh, 60 percent of uh, level of certainty about uh, trying to account for this variation. And naturally, where, where one would go at this point is to look at intercultural competence, because the more we see about student behaviors uh, at, the, at the middle and upper level, the more we see that, that uh, factors like social pragmatic strategy selection have an enormous impact on the success, uh, or, or, or let's just say are, are, are a powerful reflector of, uh, of success at level three. Uh, versus failure at level three or level two. And that's, I'm going to show you some examples of that today. So uh, to uh, start our conversation, I re recall for you the wonderful words of Claire Crouch back in 2002. Uh, learners strive to speak right and understand those who use a different semiotic system to predict text from context and context from text. Besides everyday conversation, these social processes include the production and critical interpretation of crit cultural values attitudes and beliefs. Uh, I, I think she hit it exactly right. And as we look at some of the, of the data that, that, that I want to show to you today, uh, I, think you'll see, I think you'll see evidence of all of those things taking place in, uh, in, 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 at, at the different learners. And uh, I'm going to use a quote here that I think is not so well known uh, from Jakob Spät, from the inner word, form, form of the word, written, by the way, in 1927. Uh, he writes about dialogism, saying, dialogism applies to individual words and utterances, but also to the language system as a whole, which is embedded with the products of a continuing generalized dialogue with other users of the language. To know a language, you must also know the general collective dialogue. A word is always half someone else's. It has to be populated, adjusted before it's yours. Words carry the scent of other voices. In the 1920s, that's not structuralism, but you can see uh, he was thinking in the right way even then. And finally, Bakhtin from uh, speech genres. Uh, 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 much of what we loosely refer to, the word, to, to a word's connotation may in fact be the stylistic aura resulting from the word's usual generic context. Typical contexts seem to adhere to words. That echoes right back to what Claire was saying a moment ago in terms of how, how, uh, how, how, they, uh, how they predict one another. Um, let me uh, describe for you, if I can, uh, in, in a generic way, the design that uh, American Councils uses in the administration of these three large overseas federal programs that we're going to be talking about today. One aimed at high school students, one aimed at undergraduates, and one aimed at graduate students. Um, they have a certain similarity. Uh, this is not... Um, uh, I want to say a Delphi College abroad in the sense that it's, it's not an attempt to transplant an American educational institution overseas. We work with organic, local, indigenous structures. Uh, but having said that, uh, it is important to know that investments in overseas faculty is an ongoing process and a very necessary thing. If you're working with local institutions overseas, rather than going over there and teaching people yourself, then, then you have to be willing, just as you would here in the United States, to invest in the professional development of those you're depending on to deliver the training. Uh, similarly, uh, the uh, use of host families in our system is a fairly rigorous contractual arrangement between our organization or a partner and the local host family that stipulates in a fair amount of detail uh, what behaviors are going to be required by the family. It excludes the use of English. It uh, gives a fair amount of training to the family, uh, both so they know how to deal with emergencies when they come up, but also how they, how they reach out to students uh, and, and engage them in ways that are appropriate for the age and for their language learning goals. Uh, we interview families. We visit them once a month. Uh, we do not leave that relationship to chance. That, that has to be, if it's a country where a host family is possible, then that is a managed relationship. It takes about as much time as as working with faculty, actually, because it's, it's a whole separate uh, activity. And similarly, I can say the same for volunteer, uh, for internship supervisors and volunteer and service opportunity overseers. At the bottom of the list here, the thing I want to draw your attention to is the bi-weekly language utilization report, or LUR. Uh, because that's an online reporting instrument that is going to provide the data that we're going to look at today. Uh, students 
uh, it is uh, really a self-management device. Uh, I would like to tell you that students, whether graduate students, undergraduates, or high school students, come to their overseas experience and to their pre-departure orientations uh, with a strong sense of self-management. Uh, uh, the, the fact is they seem to not be very skilled in terms of self-management strategies. Uh, for many of them, frankly, going overseas is the first time when they really have to take charge of their own learning because everything that happens from the moment they step off the plane is potentially a learning device. It's also real and it has consequences and people react to what they say or don't say as human beings do in such cases. So it is high stakes in that sense. And uh, we use the LURs therefore uh, to serve on the one hand as a sort of a journal, as a time place map. Students keep track of kind of where they're using their language and what sort of situations and also as a goal setting. They report back to us every two weeks, tell us about a speech situation that went particularly well. Americans like that. We start, let's, talk, let's start with success. And they tell us about a situation that went well. Now let's talk about a situation that did not go as well as you thought. Describe that situation. And then finally, what goals would you set for next week? What do we need to work on next, right, to do this? And how do you, how do you want to work on that? That's the sort of, in a, in a nutshell, that is what the language utilization report is. It's filed online, so it's not seen by the host family. It's not seen by the resident director. Uh, not seen by the folks overseas. They did, did tell the truth, right, on, on this. Um, now, uh, that's a list of direct enrollments. Uh, those are serious things. I'll come back to that. But anyway, I've told you there are very explicit instructions on how to fill this out uh, in terms of you know, how to write down hours. In view of the challenges, describe what language cultural resources will you need to master to have greater control over to deal more effectively when a similar situation arises next time you see. Then there's, there's again the goal situation, the goal setting. Um, goals for the months ahead, and of course students can write their comments at any point. Uh, the information comes back to me, for example, in a research mode, sometimes looking like that, where there you can see uh, all the activities that students, this happens to be a sample for Russian, uh, you're actually looking at, right there, 64,335.56 hours of recorded uh, overseas uh, hours of use. Um, and uh, the, the categories are what you see here from time spent in formal classes to doing your homework uh, to, with the host family or reading the paper, watching TV, uh, hanging out with friends, uh, uh, and so forth, local radio, television. Um, so, and, and this um, uh, is sort of the same across languages. Let me tell you then about what the uh, participant demographics looked like. Uh, within the Nestle Y program annually, the U.S. government supports 656 high school age kids uh, in summer and year-long programs overseas in seven critical language areas. There's a great deal of competition for the program and the students in that sample come from every state in the, in, in the United States. Some of them are beginners and you'll see that in the data, the results. Some are not. Uh, and the idea, of course, is if you're in a high school where a less commonly taught language is, is taught, you'll have an advantage in, in this program. Uh, some of these folks are gap year students um, and uh, deliberately have taken a year off from college in order to do it. The CLS program targets undergraduates and early graduate students with a summer intensive program only. There are 13 overseas summer institutes and um, some of them are represented here in this room. A total of 585 people take part. The uh, CLS program is jointly administered by American Councils that oversees about seven of those things and uh, KORD that oversees the other group. Uh, average age of those participants is 23, a little older than I would have guessed. And finally, the flagship program, here I'm referring only to the multi-institutional flagship programs, have about 250 participants a year. Uh, these are people who have already established a minimum of level two proficiency at the outset of the program and will go over to work for, to become level three speakers. Uh, we're going to look at Nestle Y, the kids first, because that's sort of pertinent to what we were just talking about. And there are the numbers approximately for the summer of 2011 by language. Uh, these are the outcomes of that program because uh, we do pre and post uh, proficiency measurements of the students and there you can see uh, this is Nestle Y uh, and you can see the big blue bar on the left shows you that just under 50 percent of all our summer Nestle students come with zero levels of language and hence begin their study overseas. Um, the red bars show you the outcomes of the programs. 
And there you can see uh, uh, over the course of a, of, of, a, of a year or a summer, you get a broad range of outcomes, some well into the intermediate range. Uh -huh. This is all. <laughs> This is all. Now, I can break them down, and I'm happy to tell you that we do test for reading and listening. I'm going to show you some reading and listening stories, too. It's not just about oral uh, facility. It is about literacy, uh, and very importantly for this group. Now, this, for example, the reading stores of a subset of Nestle, Nestle Wise Summer uh, students. Reading stores, you can see uh, entering proficiency in blue, exiting proficiency in red. Uh, that's pretty good. These are difficult languages. These are students, for the most part, with not too much in the way of background. And you can see their outcomes are uh, really remarkable. Listening scores, pretty much consistent with speaking scores. And there's a picture from the Nestle Y program, the Hindi program. Um, let's look at, at some of the specimens of student assessment of their learning and their intercultural experience. And I invite you to uh, uh, comment on, on, on kind of the level of intercultural sophistication that you see here. Uh, I, I'm not advocating either Bennett or Byram in this case. As a federal program, I have to use the ILR. And so uh, wh whatever, <laughs> and it's, it, ILR is heavily influenced actually by the other two. Uh, so uh, it, it, this, is, this is my modest imputation of what I think you're seeing there uh, is a, a kind of an ILR level one intercultural uh, competence level. Uh, differences assessed, aided by language and high culture, and the effect. I do love the quote. She says, dance like language articulates a story and allows one to communicate. In studying both language and ballet, I gained a unique perspective on a nation's history. This is sort of on that level of appreciation. Um, uh, it's, it's fairly high level in a sense, uh, and uh, by that I mean not necessarily deep, uh, but the young woman certainly has, uh, has, has a strong affect associated with her time in Russia and appreciation of, of the differences is something that's meaningful for her. Uh, and certainly appreciation of Russia's uh, performing arts, which I think most of us would agree with, they, they are good indeed. Uh, here's, here's another example. Learning Hindi helped define my experience here, discovering Hindi's, India's culture for the first time while learning Hindi was a gift. There are some words or phrases that are so uniquely Indian uh, and so forth. Again, that sort of access point is what, on, the, on the level of individual words is very typical of level, if you call it ILR level one, right? Notice that the words have kind of opened up the door a little bit. Uh, they're not talking about higher level uh, interactions, uh, but, but, but at a certain level of appreciation, if you will, word level access. They appreciate differences. Remember, even seeing the differences is a step. That's already valuable. Uh, from Morocco, level one, uh, not only the language, uh, Alhamdulillah and Insala were, were uh, second hand in only two weeks, but the culture and the people most of all. I wasn't expecting to do much with my host father since I do not have a father at home, but he soon became a cornerstone in my vocabulary study. Again, notice it's very word level, but very important to him. Every night he would pronounce my flashcards for me and at dinner would ask me the words for the things in Arabic, French, and English. Now that I'm leaving, I wonder if I will come across such genius, generosity, and kindness given without thought or repayment. Morocco has changed me, and I hope that one day my Arabic skills will allow me to do the same. That's touching. And there you can see the way that young man is using his time. I've been thinking of Celeste's time with her in, on her farm down there, right? It wasn't, this wasn't always easy, uh, but, but the father got it. And it was a, a, you, there's, there's linguistic and behavioral differences permit an awareness of an alternative value of systems, one different than my own. That is, that, is, uh, that is viable and is, 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 in fact, precious. There it is again, that wonderful word. Uh, Sonia, say it out loud so everybody hears it at least once right. <laughs> All right. A short prayer required an exhale for the tongue. Again, a fascination with the sounds of the language. Very typical of this, again, this linguistic cue to an alternative view of the world uh, that, that for this level of learner is, uh, is, is kind of informing. Um, I, I won't make you read every one of these things, but here's, here's an issue of, of stereotypes. Uh, I feel that there's some fascinating conversations with my family and others. We were able to really overcome some of the stereotypes and spread understanding about our countries. Again, very high level, a bit superficial, but, but you could see there's, there's affect and there's, uh, there's affection uh, that's developing for a place that is different. Uh, there's also uh, ambitiousness about career 
and uh, a decision to do Arabic studies when I begin at Northwestern University. We should have told them they should have been at, at the University of Arizona if you're really, really serious about that. But uh, t t uh, here's one. Um, uh, towards the end of my, look at this one. Uh, another, another Nestle Y student, but one of those that was way down on the list in my view. Towards the end of my year, after months of practice and countless grammatical, stylistic, vocabulary errors, I was able to uphold conversation almost indefinitely about a topic that I cared about, any topic I cared about. For me, the crowning moment regarding Arabic during my year in Egypt was when I discussed the Israeli-Palestinian conflict with a Palestinian refugee for an hour. He did not speak English. Right? Now, there you see that ability. That's the hallmark of level two, where we see that ability to move into this an awareness of differences, but also that ability to negotiate what would be a sensitive or even in some discourse, taboo subjects. Uh, and yet this young man is able to work through that, at least in his view, uh, he succeeded. And um, you know, this self-assessments at, at this level are good. This young man is also a two in speaking, and not, not surprisingly. Uh, and then an, another one, uh, a word level example from Hindi. Uh, and uh, here's another two level, this time from Russia, where the student says, my ability to engage with the locals and understand the culture is totally dependent on my language ability. Improvement, my, my Russian was a huge accomplishment for me and as my Russian improved, I was able to make friends, attend lectures, read, watch the news, and engage more directly with the culture. You see all these uh, forms of interaction that are being spelled out for you here uh, that are consistent with this level of linguistic but also of intercultural competence. My time in Russia reinforced the basic language skills I learned, gave me a thorough understanding, grammar, and plenty of speech and listening practice. I think that's the most important part and so forth. Uh, there are, these are a lot, this, this is wonderful. Uh, if someone says I'm feeling sick, she writes, she's, this, is a, this is a breakthrough. You don't say, oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> like you do in America. If you say I'm sorry, people will say, why? What did you do? <laughs> there are lots of small cultural differences like that. It's fun because it makes you question why Americans do things the way they do them. There you can see that sort of underlying view of the world that is Americans. And this has to do with something we were talking about just now. It's the same way Russians apologize very differently when they make you wait, right? The last thing you do is put yourself in the role of the agent of the cause, right? We Americans rush in instantly, rhetorically, and say, oh, I'm sorry, fine, it's, it's my fault, right? We rush to, to assume responsibility instantly, right? That's a very American way to do it. Be careful, right? That sort of sense of who's the agent and who's the cause is very fun. It's anthropologically different uh, uh, in, 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 in other cultures. And here's another example right here. Why are you apologizing for something you had no control over, right? I can walk in the market and converse with the shopkeepers using about 80% Arabic. I'm afraid I'm able to friend them and tell them who I am, where I'm from, and I, what I'm doing, and why they should give me a realistic price. That's uh, one of the things specifically, I think, in the, uh, in the IES uh, intercultural index. This ability to actually go to the souk and market and, and, and haggle is, is, is an identified function of level two, uh, at least in, in that one. Uh, I called that, but I wasn't so sure in this case. I called it level one. I see functioning, ability to behave and carry out routine social and bargaining functions. It may be a two, I, I, I don't know. Um, maybe it is. When the winter break finished and I was described as something like a natural Turkish speaker since I was using many Turkish sayings and gestures, right? Uh, now, uh, it was special to me because I felt accomplished in adapting to the language, not just by learning in class, but by listening and living there. Uh, I was impressed by that. Uh, I'd like to know again what the Turkish family really thought of this language, but we do know the test scores. We know the guy is, uh, is up there. So it, it probably is reliable. Uh, we have at least one vantage, alternative vantage point on these comments, not the many it would be really good to have, like, like who said that? Um, this is successful incorporation of embedded cultural references and appropriate nonverbal behaviors, really good example of uh, kind of the correlation of, of language and intercultural uh, interaction. Um, uh, I'm sorry, we can just, this, this is a very interesting thing. This is a true story. It happened this past summer. Hu Jintao received one of our Nestle Fellows. You've got to believe that's an important thing, <laughs> especially if you're Chinese. And you can read, I won't read that to you, uh, but this sort of little bit wide-eyed, a little bit naive, sort of, gee, 
they're patriotic too. Right? They, they, live, they live in a really repressive place, but they're still patriotic, and you believe that. And that issue of, on the one hand, well, that's really something, I hadn't thought of it. And then at the same time, that sort of lack of what we call critical thinking, about it. Now think just for a minute. Do you remember the Korean funerals and those public displays of mourning? How sincere was all of that, right? Remember, you're a very public event involving the president of China. Does all this enthusiasm, must that be taken at face value? Is that all deeply felt by everyone in that room? He doesn't ask that question, right? Now I, I call that a one uh, because he's, he's noticing a difference. It's, and this is still that early stage of just dawning. CLS, program two, uh, give me a clue on the timing right now. Are we... Okay, okay, right. Uh, we're halfway. Uh, those are the languages of the CLS program. And I'm going to show you some test data on the CLS next. And there you can see the CLS program also inducts a certain number of people at zero level. But most of the critical language summer programs are... Uh, at uh, intake at the intermediate, you can see most are intermediate, and you can see most of them, you can see the difference in the course of eight weeks. We know better than to expect huge leaps in proficiency in the course of an eight-week summer program, but if you look at the group and if you look at the shift, you can see the median clearly moves down the scale uh, for the whole population as a result of that program. With uh, 32, uh, actually, uh, that number I'm not sure the percent, that number uh, in, in the two is, is quite strong. Right? We had to see that we had only 11 in that level to begin with. That's, you know, that's, actually, a, that's actually a picture in Meknes. Uh, some cultures won't let you sit on the concrete like that, uh, but uh, here, here it's fine, and that's one of our students in the Moroccan program. Um, uh, just, again, parallel comments now of people at this level. I won't sh stop with all of them, but uh, here is an example of a very strong sort of teacher-student interaction. My language teacher was one of the best parts of this program. She really taught me so much about Japanese language and culture. It was more than just my tutor. She was a very dear friend. We're still keeping in touch. That's a very, very important affect in, in, in this. Uh, there's an example of language and, social, uh, and cultural socialization through language and a teacher. Living with the Japanese family is a great way to learn about Japanese culture and practice daily. It's truly an unforgettable experience, and I plan to stay in touch with my family. The student breaks it down by skills. My goal is to learn more cultural things and how they are interrelated with the language, spend time with host family, explore the city. This comes straight off the language utilization report. This is my goals for next time. Advice for future uh, CLS participants in Turkey. Uh, this one says, I've got to improve my interactions with city residents. I will keep trying to explore the city and put, put myself in situations where I have to speak Turkish on the streets. That's, that's self-management going on there. Right. That's a person who's take, taking charge of their learning. Uh, and, uh, and it's a kind of a level two challenge that they're facing. Speak more, especially with native speakers. Jump into conversations, even when I'm not fully confident in my ability to keep up. That can be risky sometimes. Uh, but there's a student who's trying to overcome their own reticence and shyness uh, in, a, in, in a Russian situation. Again, a self-management strategy connected to strengthening intercultural uh, comp uh, competence. Uh, and another good example right there. Continue to speak with Russian. This one's going to a Tatar village notice. My favorite part about studying my host country is bargaining with vendors. There's another haggling scene. And again, we see that as level two. Participates acceptably, acceptably in many routine intercultural interactions, including work-related. That would seem to fit the uh, ILR level two ICC rating. Um, this one, I would say, is kind of a mix of level one and two immersion strategies. And there's another reminder of how important the well-constructed homestay can be. My host family is the main contributor to my understanding of Chinese culture and lifestyle. I have twin 16-year-old girls in my house, and though they argue quite a bit, it's a pretty special, interesting experience. They are incredibly patient with me and really want to understand what I'm saying and vice versa. My Chinese parents here are very nurturing and kind. And you can see that family working, that every speech situation that happens is something you can learn from. It's not a matter, remember, of 
how just how do you say please pass the salt, right? It's never about that. It's about the whole sort of cycle of life that happens inside a family, with people arguing, disagreeing, complaining, agreeing, uh, inviting, uh, re reprimanding. All of that are contextualized, socio-pragmatic situations that you have to master, and they're all very, very rich. That's, that's, that's why the repetition of family life is so helpful to a learner at this point. You can't get people out on the street to go through that with you. At that point, you get one shot, and that's it. Um, This is about a trip to the barber. You'd be surprised how many trips to the barbers we get at this level. This is, this is a very big deal. <laughs> if you're first time overseas doing this on your own and, and taking the risk of telling this, for this barber how, how you want your hair and, you know, good luck that you get. This, this is remarkable, and this is a heritage speaker. Uh, this is a level three, and I wanted to share it with you. I now realize that I came to Azerbaijan with a preconceived notion that I would find nothing positive about the subservient role of women in traditional Azerbaijani culture. As a very independent American female, it was difficult for me to adjust to the gender divisions in Azerbaijan because I felt that women were treated as second-class citizens. To show respect to my relatives, I tried to abide by their cultural norms and remain segregated with the other women. The women prepared food and served the men, cleaned up after them, and then waited until the men had finished before being allowed to eat themselves. This is typical of the Southern Caucasus all across Central Asia. Although this aspect of Azerbaijani culture was difficult for me to accept, I also came to realize that this gender division has some positive aspects. I found a deep sense of camaraderie among my female relatives that I have not experienced before. There was a complete sense of freedom in the way my female relatives relative expressed their feelings, concerns, and insecurities, knowing that they could reveal anything and still be accepted for it. They relied on always having a group of other women around to socialize with, which provided an ongoing sense of security. I learned that loneliness is almost a foreign concept to my Azerbaijani female relatives. They are never alone, and they never worry about being alone. My female relatives all share in their household work and so forth and child, and child care. So you see a very different set of norms uh, that, that she was prepared to reject and ultimately uh, came down with a more nuanced uh, uh, appreciation. Well, that's finally it. I'll, ended up on, I'll end with flagship. And uh, this is the year-long capstone data that we're seeing uh, for Arabic flagship over several years. Uh, you'll see most of the population enters the program at two. That's Arabic. Uh, there's the Russian sample. Uh, the, again, most you can see the mean entering proficiency is some kind of a two. A one plus, remember, is kind of a fail two. Um, and the a exit proficiency are in the three and even three plus range. Uh, this is sort of the capstone program we have. It's also federally funded. And uh, to, to sort of give you, this is a parallel, totally independently administered set of tests. This is the European framework uh, tests for C1, um, uh, which, is, which I've converted here to avoid confusion um, into uh, ILR numbers. But it's the C1 uh, test and there again. And four would represent C2, of course. So there you can see the kind of comparison. There's actually highly consistent things. Thank you. Uh, yes, flagship. And here we're going to look a little bit at that, those uh, LUR quantitative data, uh, where we see that how people spend their time overseas actually seems to have a relationship to how they end. And if you look at the chart up there, you'll see the average number of hours weekly spent doing homework by those who completed the program with a two or two plus, that is the low gainers, was just about one hour. Those that completed the program with a three was 4.9, distinctly more time. And those that completed three plus four, four plus was 7.9. You see, now, by all standards, that's not a lot of time to spend doing homework. Uh, if you ask how, how, how much time our students here spend, it's a good deal more than that. But it shows that that little qualitative difference in taking the homework assignment seriously and thoughtfully, just as if you look at the host family down here, there's the same difference. Read host family across. You can see from the entire population over a seven-year period, those who completed the program at level 2, 2 plus, on average spent 5.3 hours a week in interactions with their host family. Those that got three were 6.8, and those that high ended at three plus or four, 
spent 8.8 .8 hours a day. Now that, to me, is information I can use because in advising students and counseling students about how they're spending their time, when we see a student reporting back to us an inordinate amount of time spent in one particular activity, expensive, a lot of other uh, activities, they may be inadvertently disadvantaging themselves in terms of final outcome. Notice a kind of a quirky thing here with time spent with friends. Notice it, it's uh, 6.9 for, for uh, OPI2, 11.2 for post-test, and then it drops off again at post three, showing that hanging out with friends alone doesn't move you into the three range. You can, you can spend the 10 hours with your friends a week, that's great for level two, and it'll really strengthen your level two and two plus, but if you wanna do level three, you've gotta do some other things too, like academic reading, like following the press, like uh, things that actually are professional. Uh, uh, looking at the just uh, time spent with friends, look at the bottom line there, I can't go over the whole thing. This is the Arabic set, 9.8, <laughs> it's actually higher for those that stored lower and lower for those that stored higher. So just to show this, it's all the question of balancing out that time. Um, we talked about food and I just have a few final examples to show you. What we've learned in these three examples and these three huge uh, federal programs is with respect to time on task, that it's realistic to expect a person at level one overseas to engage and use the language effectively in interactions in the 20 to 25 hours a week range. That's a realistic expectation of actual use. At level two, you can see that jump, that, that amount of time on task, uh, the substantive, go to 40 to 45 hours a week. And finally, at level three, you'll see these hit 75 to 85 hours a week at level three. In other words, how much really can you demand of a student? In other words, how much language do they have in order to do the things we say that are necessary at a certain level? There's, and that's, that I wanna offer is part of the explanation of why uh, contact time and proficiency usually correlate uh, because uh, they're, 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 it's, it's, it's clear. Um, I won't show you that one. I had a couple of examples that are really remarkable with respect to the kind of the construction and selection of an identity uh, that is consistent with this level of um, uh, uh, pro proficiency. Uh, where we see conscious awareness of significant differences in the whole country and one's own and not always able to adjust our behavior uh, to, uh, to fit them, or sometimes because we don't wish to adjust our behavior to do that. Both encounters left me feeling uncomfortable, to say the least. That's a person early on in their program saying, I find the Russians are pretty forward and, and their intonations sound angry and so forth. It's a very typical reaction of a foreigner early on uh, to, uh, to Russian discourse. Um, here's, here's an absolutely hilarious story of, uh, of a woman in a, in a, in a homestay uh, in which the, there's a generational difference here as well as a cultural difference. And she's being told that this young man that's courting you, he, he is up to no good. He's just looking for a ticket out of the country. You must understand that. And it's that kind of uh, uh, intrusion into her private life that, uh, that she's dealing with here. I didn't feel comfortable telling them to mind their own business, she says. And so she dealt with it. I need to figure out how to say, thanks for your concern, but I've got this one covered. And introduce a new topic, right? Um, uh, there are, uh, I'm gonna skip uh, because we're almost out of time. I'm gonna end with this one. Um, and this is remarkable. And then this is a homestay situation. And this is a level three encounter where she says, and then we talked about her boyfriend and what's wrong with him. This is with the young daughter in the house. And this is the last one. Maybe this is just a normal conversation for anyone to have. I only had to ask one word, she says here. And I, I was pretty mistake free, not a big deal, except that I was trying to be convincing and really supportive. You see, there's a, there's a, a convincing, there's an arguing function going on here. It's persuasive speech. She, the host family sister, thanked me for all the great advice and support and said she felt much better having talked to me about it. Among my friends at home, I often play this role, and to have been unable to play this part until now is to have effectively become another person, or at the very least, to have not been fully me. It's like the American me and the Russian me are beginning to mesh together. I like that. I like that a lot. Being able to be almost completely yourself in a foreign language, in a foreign land, makes one feel a whole lot less like a monkey on a tricycle. <laughs> All right, we'll stop there. Thank you.
and the reference to identity competence was to Valerie P P Pellegrino Avani. She was one of those, one of the Bryn Mawr graduate student of mine in the mid 90s whose book on constructing the self in the study abroad environment uh, uh, appeared around 2004 in uh, Cambridge University Press. In fact, just, just a, I, the reference was there and I didn't make it. Okay. Our next presenter is Mary Giorgio from the University of Nicosia with her presentation, International Students' Intercultural Experiences in Cyprus. Hello. So, yes, I'm Mary Giorgio from uh, Cyprus, and I'm here to report on a small-scale study that we are currently conducting with a, a colleague who unfortunately couldn't make it. I'm a bit shorter, yes. Um, yes, this is a small scale study that we are um, conducting with um, a colleague who couldn't make it. So um, it's quite recent. We started collecting data uh, last spring and uh, it's a uh, work in progress. So I'm here to tell you about our preliminary findings. So um, first I will uh, refer a little bit to the, our theoretical background, why we are doing the study, our methodology, uh, talk to you a little bit about how we approach the data, uh, then talk about my context. Uh, I think it's quite important because I do not expect you to know much about Cyprus, which is a, a small and faraway country. Uh, then I will present to you some more of our uh, first findings. Basically, we are trying to find what is important to these international students and uh, what are the perceptions of their study abroad experience and how do they view the home culture. So some insights that result from this and um, some implications for practice. So uh, what we did with my colleague, uh, Dr. Christine Savido, is that we combine our different expertise. We, we are both language teachers, but we also recently finished our doctorate in the teacher education. Only she has a background in phenomenology and narrative research whereas my doctorate was in intercultural competence in foreign language teaching. So uh, international students study abroad is new ground for us, but um, quite fascinating. So uh, she brings in the phenomenology, the, the idea that there is no objective reality and what we see as reality is just our perception, whereas I bring in the intercultural competence um, component and um, the idea that a successful out outcome of study abroad should result in uh, development of international students into intercultural competence. However, uh, numerous studies point to a lack of contact between home and international students and a tendency for them to make friends within their own culture group or with other international students. But our ideal is that uh, universities move from symbolic to transformative internationalization. That is, um, they are not only interested in the revenue generated by international students, but they are also uh, interested in um, cultural learning resulting for both uh, student bodies, international and home students. So uh, we set off trying to investigate our international students' experiences in and outside the classroom in order to isolate salient issues. And um, as far as we know, we are the first to do so in Cyprus. There hasn't been any, any prior research about international students. Uh, explore their beliefs, their perceptions and feelings about their study abroad experience, identify their sociocultural needs so that we develop insight 
uh, into their views on the issue of cultural mix, mix and their perceptions of home culture. And uh, we are also trying to identify causes of obstacles, if there are any, to their cultural adaptation. So what we did so far is that uh, we had a first phase of data collection last spring. We conducted face-to-face -face interviews with uh, six international students and uh, we identified some themes and we used uh, interview extracts that we brought to a second group of international students, hoping that one narrative would trigger off another narrative and that the second group, the focus group interview, would react to their peers' impressions. So the first themes that we identified were mostly about, um, a little bit about that teaching, but mostly about uh, mixing with uh, Cypriot students, language difficulties, social life, and discrimination, perceived discrimination. And uh, we try to have a, a sample as inclusive as possible of the different nationalities that we have at the university. And um, we also uh, excluded first year students so that the students had been at the university for some time and have a feel of what the, the university is like and what life is in Cyprus is like. And we had seven male and five female students. Now, the way we approach data is uh, thematic analysis, qualitative content analysis. Uh, we are trying to identify themes. And um, our approach to data is grounded in intercultural competence and critical multiculturalism theories. Um, I worked extensively on the work of Byram during my, thesis, my dissertation but I isolate this um, definition because I think it's very important to be willing to want to interact with another culture. And um, we also take into consideration that um, our, the way we see other cultures is never neutral nor objective. And uh, that our objective, our ideal, is that students become critical agents, critical citizens in democracies, embracing cultural diversity, and that our universities should take an explicit anti-racist perspective, which is not the case, at least for my university. And this should be reflected in curricula, materials, policies, and teacher-student interaction. Now, my context, my university is the largest private university. Now, universities are quite recent in Cyprus. We had our first universities 30 years ago and the first um, public university uh, funded by the government uh, 20 years ago. So this is the largest private university with 5,000 students. And 20% uh, of the student body are international students from 80 different countries. Now, most programs run in English, so our, multi our faculty and staff are, is quite multicultural. And uh, our programs are inspired by Amer American academic models, but they increasingly adapt to European standards because of the Bologna process this process of standardization of uni uh, European universities so that students will be able to travel from one country to another and f continue their studies. Now, what may be of interest to you is uh, Cyprus as a context. It is, as I said, a small island in southeastern Mediterranean and the population, please don't laugh, is 800,000 people. And we recently had a census which showed that 20% of the population is uh, foreign. But um, 
what may be significant for us is that it showed that uh, the foreign population has doubled within 10 years, the last 10 years, because immigration is very recent. It's a recent phenomenon in Cyprus. What is also important for us, especially home students, regarding home student perceptions of cultural otherness, is the fact that the country is divided and has been divided since 1974, following a war. And now Turkish Cypriots live in the north of the island and uh, Greek Cypriots live in the south. And this division is geographical, political, but also psychological. And uh, there are numerous studies that point to the fact that the way Greek Cypriots perceive the Turks and the Turkish Cypriots has implications for the way they perceive other Muslim populations and by extension to all cultural others. The fact that, you know, they grow up and they are um, taught at school, education talks a lot about the enemy, the big enemy. So it is also my assumption that there is this mistrust and negative stereotyping is extended to all others. So um, to give you an idea where Cyprus is, though politically it belongs to the European Union since 2004, you can see that geographically we belong to the Middle East. Now, some of the findings. So indeed, um, what is more important to students, international students, is uh, their social life, um, the difficulty uh, to mingle with home students, a perceived discrimination in and outside the university, and the language difficulties that have to do with learning, but also with socialization. Now, the rich literature international students that we have in, in our hands is mostly, mostly refers to, the, to US universities, Australian universities, and British universities. But in Cyprus, the particularity is that programs are taught in English, but the language or the official language of the country is Greek. And uh, this is the language that, um, of the majority of the students. So there is this artificial situation where students, uh, most students are Greek Cypriot, most lecturers are Greek Cypriot, but they speak between them in English in class. And so sometimes Greek Cypriot students will switch into Greek in class. And of course, international students are automatically, feel automatically excluded. In the same way, in order to socialize Greek Cypriots, if there is a group of Greek Cypriots, five people, it's more difficult for them to switch into English so that they include international students and they become friends with them. So this is a problem uh, that they face. So generally, uh, our international students report so far that they are satisfied with their studies but not satisfied at all with our contact with home students. And I will read some extracts to you. Uh, Violetta, a Bulgarian student, talks about mixing with home students, saying that, um, I mean, many people would say hello to you and will be very friendly towards you, but that's all. I mean, they will not get into any further relation with you and build friendship. And this... Um, resonates with vo what Volet and Ang are saying about a student's tendency for low levels of cross-cultural interactions. Uh, about discrimination, um, uh, Richard, a student from Zimbabwe, saying about his um, peers, sometimes in class I just go sit on a computer and there are two three computers next to me, but you see people go and sit 333 three, three, and some will just stand next to me, look for a computer, 
It's only when they see that they can't find one. That's when they sit next to me. Um, Han, a Chinese student, talks about her difficulties with English and uh, reports on a, a perceived discrimination by a lecturer. I know my English is not good, so usually when I lost information in the class, I will wait and I will go see the lecturer to ask him. But this lecturer, he said to me, well, if you don't speak English, why you come here? Adnan, a Jordanian student, talks about a friend, a Cypriot friend he has, but who hid this from his mother. He didn't say he was going out with his Jordanian friends because she always thinks that every Arab is Turkish and stuff like that. Most, like all people here in Cyprus, they usually think that every Arab is Turkish. Now, how do students perceive uh, um, the host community? Not very positively. So um, we do see ghettoized patterns of interaction. Um, they also perceive that the host community rejects them and they see these boundaries are as, as impermeable the, the expression, Cypriots are always together, Cypriots are all together, comes over and over again. But they also tend to negatively stereotype the host community. So um, they resort to negative stereotyping themselves. Um, I will read some extracts for you. Boris, a Belarusian student, uh, is saying, well, Cypriot people as a culture, they are easygoing. I mean, obviously, there is a lack of discipline. I mean, I'm coming from Belarus. In Belarus, I mean, it's much more different. You just, you, you can't just come, for example, uh, late in class and say, hi, you know, have a seat, and that's all. Of course, this is a complaint that often Northern European students have, that Cypriot students come in late and they don't even apologize. Um, Nasser, an Iranian student, he's, he told us that he's been in Cyprus for nine years and he learned Greek. And because he speaks Greek, he made a lot of Greek friends. So he takes an insider, outsider, outsider position. But um, so all these students, they, though they sometimes they negative, negatively stereotype Cypriot students, they also uh, express a strong wish to socialize with them. They are not indifferent. And they even uh, make suggestions for changes in practice that would promote intercultural relations. For instance, they suggest that uh, teamwork should be generalized because it really forces people to, um, to talk to each other. And that's what uh, Nasser is saying. He uses the word repeatedly, forcing people to socialize with each other. And teamwork is important because you get into class and uh, you will be forced to engage with other people and uh, afterwards you can exchange emails and phone numbers. And so he's describing the evolution of a relationship from the classroom to outside the classroom. They also, there is also some cultural self-awareness. For instance, our Jordanian students is saying, yes, there is uh, some uh, xenophobia and there is some nationalism in Cyprus, but I understand because in Jordan we would do the same. Um, I quote, sometimes when, when you see Cyprus together and stuff like that, like in my opinion, I think that I don't actually blame them because Cyprus is a country full of international people. So even in my country sometimes we face that like we can feel that our country is going 
like everyone around is not from the same country. So, some insights resulting from um, these preliminary findings. Um, they agree with Bartram, there is this, taxon this hierarchy in their needs. First, there are socio-cultural needs, then there are academic needs, and finally, practical needs that they mention, such as accommodation, jobs, uh, support system upon arrival. But what is uh, different from the literature that we have reviewed is that here, um, international students and home students can be seen as almost on equal terms in, in terms of learning because English is also a foreign language to Cypriot students and sometimes even international, some international students like this student from uh, Zimbabwe or another female student from Ghana, uh, their English is, can be much better than the Cypriots. And also the, the system of teaching is new to Cypriot students because as I said, it's an American system. They haven't been prepared at school for critical thinking or for research skills, so they struggle as well. But the fact that English is a foreign language for both, as, for both communities is both a strength and a weakness for international students because as I said, they will socialize and they will switch uh, into Greek as soon as they can. And um, I will read uh, another extract that I call the Lost in Translation extract of Richard, the student from Zimbabwe. When we are doing teamwork, for me it's easier to work with other foreigners because if you work with Cypriots, they start speaking in Greek for five minutes and then they explain to you and they explain only two things. And they say, ah, don't worry, it's okay. But I'm worried, and I should be worried. So I will finish with some implications for practice. Um, apparently, some institutional practices may have a direct impact on the lack of culturally mixed groups, and though the university states uh, its multiculturalism. Maybe it needs to do some things more. For instance, um, sports events are not visible. There are not enough mixed uh, clubs and societies. And uh, even um, the presence of ethnic societies, I'm not sure how he helpful they are. Um, I, um, at the beginning of, of each academic year, we have a special program for uh, new students. And um, I saw that there was every day an information meeting for Greek students, but for international students, there was only one at the end of the program. So something is wrong there. So the university should try to increase opportunities for social interaction, uh, intercultural interaction, and should sponsor organizations and activities such as the ones that I told you before. Um, there are no academic courses on intercultural communication yet. There are some uh, courses on ethnography, anthropology, but not on intercultural communication. Um, Something that I read and I heard also from colleagues from other universities, the mentor systems for newcomers, the fact that one home student can be in charge of uh, an international student who just arrived. An active anti-racism on an institutional level. And finally, uh, the integration and promotion of intercultural ideals through exchange programs. They, these are quite recent in Cyprus because of the European Union. Erasmus, for instance, and Erasmus Mundus. And as I said, this is new ground for me, so as many of you are more experienced than me, uh, your feedback is most welcome. Thanks a lot.
And the last presentation for this session is from Casey Peckinpah at the University of Arizona. Her presentation is The Home Institution's Role in Developing Intercultural Competence in Study Abroad. Thank you. And thank you to my previous presenters for uh, giving me the stage in such a, in such a great fashion. Uh, as Katie said, this presentation deals with the home institution's role in, um, in preparing students uh, not only for study abroad, but also then bringing them back into the, um, into the university system. So in this, in this presentation, what I will be looking at is uh, essentially first the problem, which is more theoretical in, in, uh, in nature, but also does uh, look at some, some um, research studies. And then moving towards a potential solution, which is fostering non-cultural or language-specific intercultural competence. Don't get upset with me yet. I'll explain what that is when I get there. Um, and at this point, we'll be, I will be integrating pre looking at integrating previous and anticipated cultural encounters, home or abroad, into the classroom. Um, and then also looking at the advantages and challenges of having a mixed classroom. So what, uh, what is helpful about having students uh, in the classroom who have already studied abroad versus having students in the class who have not yet studied abroad. Uh, and then looking at uh, how we can use university resources to better integrate the study abroad experience into the complete undergraduate curriculum. The problem with study abroad. Um, we've heard a lot of, a lot of speech uh, talks thus far that have talked about the, the potential that study abroad has, uh, what it can do. But uh, earlier in Celeste Kinger's talk, she talked about that it doesn't necessarily, uh, it will not necessarily uh, turn into what study abroad could do. Um, study abroad is often touted as, ide as the ideal means to improve language and culture learning. However, that's not necessarily the case, and there have been a number of studies that look at uh, either language or culture learning and see that they're not necessarily guaranteed outcomes. Um, some of them are listed below. There's many more. Uh, in any event, study abroad, uh, we can't necessarily guarantee that it's going to be that transformative experience. Uh, study abroad in reality, uh, at the 2009 NASFA conference, um, Michael Wolf gave a, uh, had a great quote uh, to that extent. Study abroad is not a ride in Disneyland, where in return for buying an admission ticket, participants are guaranteed a thrill. Instead, participants have gained access to an opportunity to grow beyond their own narrow perspective. The statement that study abroad changed my life masks a potentially complex set of issues. Firstly, it is entirely undiscriminating in implication as if abroad were one transforming location wherein the participant will gain insight simply by being there. It consequently minimizes or fails to, disting to, to, excuse me, to distinguish between some crucial matters. What do you study? Where do you study it? How do you study it? What do you have to do to maximize the benefits? If we accept this vision of the study abroad experience, that it is far from an osmosis situation, then we can only feel compelled to maximize students' preparation to make the fullest use of the study abroad experience and to support them in the most productive ways possible and feasible before, while, and once they come back from study abroad. So this, this presentation is going to be getting to a potential solution. If we see intercultural competence as a process, something that uh, Michael Byram and also Hammer, Bennett, and Wiseman have outlined, uh, we can see the potential for fostering uh, intercultural communication learning before students ever set, foot, set foot in this magical study abroad place. So the idea is to integrate skills and strategies for language learning as well as critical cultural awareness across the curriculum, not just in the foreign language department, but across the curriculum, whether that be in business courses or science courses. Um, yes. Okay. Um, one of the studies that talks about this is uh, Coleman 2001. And they posit that pre-departure preparation for foreign encounters can aid in positive attitudes and cultural learning abroad. Um, Kinginger, who we just heard from a little bit earlier, also talked about this idea of well-designed well -designed programs that, uh, that foster this cultural learning at all stages of the, of the, of, of the experience. Um, and Shively also talks about this. She talks less about the return phase 
uh, but more about preparing students for study abroad. However, she does go back and, and add in that last element of how do we get the students to, to bring back their experiences and critically reflect on what it is they learn once they're back. So with study abroad, we've, we've heard a lot of uh, talks about how the number of students are studying of study abroad have increased. We've also heard a lot about, uh, in, in, excuse me, not that much, but to, in the, to a certain extent in this presentation, about how it's not necessarily uh, the case that students will, learn, will become culturally or linguistically advanced upon return. But with the amount of money that is being invested in students studying abroad, whether it be parents financially or the universities, we need to really think about how to do that. How do we get students, how can we give students the tools to become more culturally and linguistically ready to take on that study abroad experience once, uh, either once they go or once they return? So this, uh, this presentation is part of my dissertation. Uh, which is on, um, which is on, based on a course that is, was initially designed for um, preparing students for study abroad. It was designed by David Wright, who was the former director of the study abroad office here at the University of Arizona, who is now left. Um, however, the, the course was titled Becoming Transcultural, Maximizing Study Abroad. It was initially designed as a pre-departure course. However, because it is uh, at the University of Arizona, which is a very large university, and also a general education course, uh, we have a lot of students that just sign up because it's an open course. Uh, so in this class, we have students who have studied abroad. We have students who have no intent of studying abroad, although I think throughout the course of the semester, we've convinced a few of them that maybe they do want to study abroad. And then also students who have returned from studying abroad. This has happened, uh, this course has taken place two semesters. Uh, in the first semester, I co-taught it with David Wright, and in the second semester, this previous fall, I uh, taught it by myself. Um, and uh, we use the main textbook. The textbook that we use is Experiencing Intercultural Communication, which I said earlier that I would be talking about non-culture-specific uh, non and non-language-specific ways of, um, of preparing students for study abroad. It's essentially based off this book. There are certainly cultural examples and linguistic examples that help, However, uh, it's not based in, um, in the knowledge area that, for, say, for example, Byram might, uh, might say belongs to intercultural competence. We're not, we're not preparing students specifically to study abroad in China or in Germany. We're dealing more with the, the basic skills that students have that can help them when they do go abroad. Go, do go abroad. So part of that is there are cultural simulations, online discussions, and also cultural inquiries and activities that takes, take place outside of the classroom. Uh, the online discussions, I, a little bit of a footnote to that, we use the university system, um, it's, it's called D2L, Desire to Learn. If you're familiar with Blackboard, it's something like that. Essentially, it allows the students to chat asynchronously. Uh, so if I post a discussion question, students will then um, post their responses, but then also be required to respond to each other's posts. Uh, so the, the textbook itself deals with the building blocks of intercultural communication, which are essentially culture and communication. Um, and those are both very broad terms. However, these, for most students, these are brand new topics. They don't really know what these are. They've never given thought to uh, how it is that I communicate. So communication deals with both the verbal and the nonverbal aspects of communication. Um, and within, the, within these two, also more the, the formal side of linguistics. So we do, uh, because this is sponsored through the Department of German Studies, we do try and give them uh, the idea that language skills are also very important um, if you are studying abroad. Uh, what we have students do uh, is go through the, the different chapters of the book and largely look at history, identity, language and power, and pop, pop culture. However, it's all very critically. So students are, uh, are coming at these issues in a, a self-critical um, awareness building manner so that they become aware of what it is, uh, what their own, uh, how their own identity and history was built so that when they encounter other, other cultures and other languages, they're more aware of, how cult the, of the fact that culture is learned rather than a given state of being. One of the culture simulations that we do is uh, Barnga. Um, it's also known as Five Trick. Five Trick is the uh, cheap online version that you can get for free. Uh, Barnga was originally developed for um, Doctors Without Borders. 
uh, and it was designed to prepare uh, the doctors that would be going abroad to the fact that their own way of, of dealing with medicine in the United States might not be culturally appropriate abroad. And essentially, it has uh, four, four different groups. Uh, each group is given a set of cards and rules. The rules are different at each table. I don't know if any of you are familiar with this game or not. The rules are different uh, at each table. Uh, and when they are actually required to play the game, they find they are not allowed to talk. They have to do it uh, with only with, with only with hand gestures. And each different table has a different set of rules. When the tournament starts, uh, the the person who has won the highest amount of tricks has to move one way, and the person with the least amount of tricks has to move the other way. So suddenly, in the second round, they found that these cultural rules, cultural rules that they've learned at the first table, are not applicable at the second table which I don't know if you've ever had the chance to see something like this, but every time that I've seen it done, the same thing happens. People start arguing by gesturing. They start to argue about the rules, what the rules are. And when you finally tell them there were really no correct set of rules, students have to then stop back and say, okay, now wait a minute. How does this apply to my life? How does this apply to my culture? Oh, my culture is also learned. Uh, and then, Ideally, this is setting them up. This is one of the things that we do very in the very uh, beginning of the course to set the stage for the fact that culture is learned. A second simulation is Rocket. I won't go into as much detail with that. However, Rocket, uh, the Rocket simulation, um, goes to goes back to the Cold War era and uh, how the different different countries, uh, Europe. I think they, I think the groupings were Europe, um, Russia. Japan and the United States, and they're all trying to work together in order to build a rocket to send to the moon. However, they all have different objectives and different style of working. Um, and so what ends up happening is that this, uh, they, the, the Americans are ready to work. Uh, they're, obviously, they're following, actually, data that was, that was simulated, or excuse me, um, compiled for this with specific sets of rules. But the Americans want to work, and they want to meet a deadline. And then all of a sudden, the Europeans get up, and they walk out of the room, and they take a vacation which frustrates the Americans because they don't have, they don't have the time in their budget uh, to allot for, for, this, uh, for this change. So again, this is, this is awareness building for the students. Um, but the idea is that if, if you can build this awareness to the fact that culture is learned and that different cultures have different values and perceptions, then when they actually go abroad, um, they will be able to uh, then take, have, have this in mind. However, as I said, we have some students who have not uh, who, who are not planning on studying abroad, and some students who have already studied abroad. Um, and I'll be talking a little bit later, as I said, about some of the challenges um, of integrating these, these groups. But in the case of the rocket simulation, and, and all, essentially the cultural simulations, is what I have found, and I can only um, document this anecdotally at this point in time, is that the students uh, are able to draw from their experiences abroad when they talk about these different cultural simulations online. Oh, the five-trick barnga. Oh, when I was when I was in Italy studying abroad, this this cultural moment happened. Maybe it was something like this, which also then gives the students who are planning on studying abroad sort of an insight of what things might be like when they get abroad. Uh, we also look. We also watch a couple of films, some shorter films, um, but the full-length films, Speaking in Tongues, which is a documentary about bilingual education in the United States. Um, Crash, this was a blockbuster movie, uh, 2005 had a lot of big names, Sandra Bullock uh, was in that movie, um, fairly, fairly big movie, but in any event, it, it, um, it looks at cross sections or intersections of multiculturalism in LA, um, and students at this point in time, this, we, I generally show this about mid-semester, students are able to use some of the, um, some of the, the readings that we've done about communication, nonverbal communication, conflict style, to talk uh, in a more real manner, in a critical manner, about how these cultures are interacting. And then the last one is a film that was, it's an older film um, produced in 1988, and it's somewhat difficult to get a hold of, um, but it looks at US linguistic variation. Um, a lot of students, a lot of Americans will generally say, if you ask them, what is the worst American accent? Oh, something Southern. Well, this, this film, in, in, um, in context with the book, uh, tries to bring students uh, to, the, to the idea that, okay, there is really no linguistic stand, there is a standard, but a linguistic norm may not necessarily be uh, more or less valuable than another one. 
Um, and again, as I said, the asynchronous chat, uh, those give students the opportunity. Uh, I asked students, I said, how do you like this online, uh, this online component of the course? And they said, actually, they I was afraid that they were going to reject it outright because it was fairly flat and that it's asynchronous. But one of the students said, it's, it's really nice that we have this uh, forum to talk online because we get to see or get to read what everybody in the class says. So whereas in class, you may only have a few students, uh, one maybe who hasn't studied abroad, one who has studied abroad, and you're constantly hearing their opinions, all of a sudden the students in the class start to hear everybody's opinions. So those start to matter more. Um, and then the cultural observation activities. If you're familiar at all with intervention activities that are used in study abroad, for example, um, having students go out into the community and observe. Um, how are people greeting each other? Uh, how is food, I don't know if, if, how, how big Food City is, but Food City is, is a grocery store in Tucson that generally um, markets towards or caters towards the Hispanic population. So go to Food City, go to Safeway, go to Whole Foods. How are those different? How are the people dressed differently? And this just opens up students' uh, minds to the fact of, of oh, just brings awareness to the fact that there are different cultural intersections within their own worlds before they even go abroad. And for those that have already been abroad, it's, uh, it's more just awareness building and critical reflection. Uh, so some of the advantages and disadvantages um, of, of, having, of having a mixed classroom. Um, Post-study abroad students can provide illustrative examples from abroad. For example, I had one student who, um, this, is, this is my student that I called, she was addicted to study abroad. She had traveled a fair amount with her family growing up, and every opportunity that she has to go abroad, she's abroad. Every summer, she's actually currently in Italy right now. But she said, I, there's, there's one section in the book about authentic travel. So I asked people, I said, what is authentic travel? They said, oh, when you travel with a tour guide, that's authentic, because they're showing you certain places. And she said, well, you know, it's interesting. I went on a, I wanna, I went, when she, while she was abroad, her mother came to visit and hired a tour guide. And what she noticed was that the tour guide had brought her to places or brought them to restaurants that he was getting a commission on. So essentially, she, she wasn't necessarily getting the authentic travel experience that she thought that she was going to, which was then very valuable for the, students in the, the other students in the class who were maybe planning on studying abroad, uh, and that they could, they could start thinking about, OK, what, what are these issues? What do I need to think about when I go abroad? Um, Pre-study abroad students can also provide examples from home. Um, and one, one example that I came up with was that um, a previous student had written in one of the online forums, I feel myself that while history shapes our identity to an extent, it is not because of the groups our history places ourselves in, but based on the decisions we make within our histories. A religious or national or family affiliation may shape our identity only based on the decisions we make because of these affiliations. So what actually happened was a student who had already studied abroad quoted this student in her paper um, and then used that to relate to the fact that while she grew up in Tennessee, when she moved to Arizona, she had to make linguistic choices uh, because people were judging her based on her linguistic uh, output and that she had a, as she put it, a hick or a redneck accent, but that she was not willing to give up her cultural uh, background of being from Tennessee. So someone who is a pre-study abroad student can still provide someone who is a post-study abroad student um, awareness or uh, with, with input that can, that, can fo that can foster further reflection. And one, one point that, that I neglected to say earlier is that uh, this, is, this is an older quote. I, from 1963, so pardon me. Uh, but I think that it, it kind of hits the nail on the head. It's George Kelly, and he says, a person can be witness to a tremendous parade of episodes, and yet if he fails to keep making something out of them, he gains little in the way of experience from having been around when they happened. It is not what happens around him that make a man experienced. It is the successive construing and reconstruing of what happens as it happens that enriches the experience of his life. So to a certain extent, this course is preparing students, but also for those that have, that have been abroad and are coming back, they're having a, a uh, they, have, they have the possibility to sort of unpack their experience. What were those critical incidents that I experienced, and how do I make meaning out of them? Um, and, and as the last point on this slide, uh, post-study abroad students can share both positive and negative experiences. So while students might have a very flowery idea of, oh, when I study abroad, it's going to be wonderful, 
post-study abroad students can share the positive experiences, but also prepare their fellow classmates for the fact that well, it might not be as easy or as wonderful as I had initially thought. Uh, the challenge, uh, post-study abroad students, when they come back, they seem to be the reality. Uh, this is what study abroad was like. However, um, oops, I skipped a spot, spot excuse me. Uh, <laughs> that may not actually be the reality. So what they are presenting to their classmates, they, their classmates, their pre-study abroad students may be experiencing that as truth. They may be saying, oh, this is what she experienced, so this is the way it's going to be. Um, Post-study abroad students, I also noticed in my class, uh, sometimes got frustrated with the other students uh, because they have already had this experience and some of the other students who haven't had the experience of studying abroad may not have the, the awareness to be able to talk about uh, some, of the, some of the issues that the book brings up in the same manner. Um, the pre-study abroad students, uh, I wrote the broad extension of non-lived examples. And that is that they, may, they have had some sort of cultural experiences in their life, and that's what we're trying to draw off of. Um, but at the same time, they may extend those, they may take experiences of others and try and extend them to situations where they don't really fit because they only got a snippet of, of what that cultural conflict was. Um, one of the other challenges, and I think uh, detractors for uh, this mixed class, is that courses have to stay general. Um, they can't be tailored to specifically pre- or post-study abroad. So while I've said it can be an advantage, it can also be a disadvantage because students don't necessarily, ha I can't, or we can't give students the, the exact, we can't meet their needs exactly um, because they are mixed together. It's sort of the one-room schoolhouse uh, type situation. Um, and utilizing university resources. This, I think, is uh, very important because especially uh, smaller universities also have, uh, have these resources. But someplace like the University of Arizona where you've got a huge campus with a lot of different resources, um, they can all come to the class and help uh, not only prepare students for the, for the abroad experience, also help reintegrate them, um, but also, uh, while if you can, if you can extend this uh, class to while they're abroad, they can also help students while they're abroad. So for example, the study abroad office. We had someone come in and talk about some of the different programs and scholarships that are available to students. Uh, the career development office. There's a, uh, a lot of talk in, in higher education that the study abroad experience needs to be uh, not only better integrated back into the university, but at the same time, students need to be able to talk about their experiences in meaningful ways. Uh, and how is it that we can get, that, get students to do that? If you ask students, how was your experience abroad? It was great. Well, when you go into, the, when you go into a job interview, you're going to need something more, more uh, precise than that. The library, the library can be a great resource. How do I do research when I'm abroad? How do I, how do I uh, use the library while I'm abroad? How can I use the, the U of A's library while I'm abroad? Um, the health center, what sort of shots do I need? Something very practical manner. Uh, psychological services, how do I deal with the stress of being abroad? Uh, how do I deal with being in that culture shock type situation? And then as the last one, uh, the U of A has a Center for Middle Eastern Studies, and we actually had someone come in and talk to the class about uh, his experience and study abroad uh, as it related. And I think that the students ended up taking a lot out of that because I can only provide certain examples from uh, European context that I lived while I was abroad, but bringing in someone else who has different experiences from a different country uh, was also very helpful for the students. So as I said, this is part of my dissertation. Uh, I haven't gotten to the actual data analysis yet, so largely uh, everything is still in an anecdotal stage. Um, but future projects, we are, this, is, this class has been offered moderately hybrid, and that there are some, uh, some of the discussions that happen online. This is going to be turned into a truly hybrid format, um, where some of the, the, the course modules be, will be offered online, which will also be a challenge because, uh, as I've talked about, the five trick um, and, or Barnga simulation, those are very eye-opening for students. However, how do, you, how do you get that same level of learning in, uh, in, a, in, in an online format? Um, and this will then as I also turn into a completely online format to be marketed to business schools and potentially uh, also while students are abroad. Uh, and if we can do that, we can also add in linguistic elements, for example, and uh, have specific modules where students are, are using, um, have activities that are, that are um, designed to have them increase their intercultural competence by interacting with, with people while they are abroad. Um, 
So with that being said, thank you very much uh, for your interest, and I look forward to the questions. Question from Jeff Watson at the U.S. Military Academy. Uh, I would say first and foremost, Jeff, what you saw in those LURs is first and foremost, it's a formative self-management device for students to kind of manage their learning from one week to the next or from two weeks to the next in this case. Uh, and only secondarily uh, is it also a kind of a, a, a research source. I mean, it's, it's certainly, there's a lot of interesting data here. Whether it's all the right data to, to meet research needs is a different thing. But it exists essentially as an online advisory and self-management mechanism because I could not agree with you more that having on-program attention uh, is extremely important. What happens in the first two, three, four weeks of a study abroad program is something somewhat different than what starts happening toward the middle and toward the end. And uh, it, it can, this, this focuses on goal setting, and, but also it's, an, it's a vehicle for really posing any question or expressing frustration uh, back at the advisor who reads these uh, for comment and for assistance. Uh, we, we collect a lot of different things, but if just looking particularly at goal setting, one of the most difficult issues for students who begin a study abroad program with very high expectations, often artificially inflated expectations, uh, for some of the very reasons that the last speaker just made, because they don't have a lot of experience of thinking through, not realizing that, you know, no pain, no gain. Uh, you, you're, you're, your every speech act is not going to be a scintillating success. How do we get that across in some way? And at times that is really going to get to you, you know, the frustration of it all. It's that sort of uh, feeling like you're a fourth grader or a halfwit uh, that, that uh, you know, maintain personality and sort of validation that you're a cool person too. You're still an interesting individual. It's just every time you open your mouth in the target language, what comes out is this sort of this other thing. Uh, uh, as, a, as an experienced language teacher yourself, you know, you can't actually tell a foreign student that not anything they say is really fully correct, right? That we, we, we don't focus on that, right? Because it's the salience of what they're saying keeps growing. What we also noticed at level two plus and three, and I think the Kim Fedchak dissertation of about three years ago, is that some of the things that we teachers would actually register as, as uh, non-native-like uh, go right past an expert board of non-teacher native informants who simply don't register it because the student has sufficient fluency and volume and intonation and, uh, and the actual, the code, the little imperfections in the code are actually not registered by the native ear, right? They, they, people hear what they were supposed to hear. They hear the meaning. Uh, and so what one starts to focus on is what are the salient errors that I'm making? Uh, not the measurable imperfections, which are infinite, right? But what are the salient errors that I'm making that are kind of impeding my ability to communicate at this level that I am right now? That's why having realistic expectations about how much language use is, is realistic for a one-level speaker. Uh, what sorts of speaking goals then do you set if that's where you are in this system? You know, those can, those can be focused on more caretaker. You, you saw in, in the examples, teachers, uh, homestay parents, peer tutors, uh, there, there's an array of people around you who are there to help you bridge that gap and work with your language and sit down and even repair things from time to time. So no, I want to I wanna come all the way back and say it is first and foremost a formative device for self-management and feedback uh, and staying on task. And then only secondarily does it generate this stuff. I, I hope that's clear. Thank you. Beginning, uh, Barbara, th thank you, and I know that's a, I know you have a publication coming out in that area. Within the flagship programs, the third set that I showed you, the internship, like the direct enrollment, is an obligatory part of that program. Uh, in different countries, they, they look a bit different in terms of the total amount of time, but a typical, an internship of 12 hours a week uh, to anywhere up to 40 hours a week in the case of Nanjing. Uh, so uh, there, there is that, that's a very important component. It's required. And beginning in, uh, I, I guess it was last year or the year before, our students, because it was difficult to tease it out, frankly, uh, we instituted an internship language report 
that is distinct from the regular language utilization report, uh, just in, in, in part for, for that, sa that same reason. Uh, because the, the, the situ what, seems, what we seem to be learning is that the, the somewhat high stakes situations that come up in a real internship, and I had a slide here which I don't think I showed you that had just a list of internships that a flight ship student would be taking, they're fairly significant engagements. And it, uh, the, so that the students carry uh, a responsibility uh, that, ha that uh, not, not high stakes, but it's pretty important. And so failure, uh, linguistically, culturally, uh, uh, to, to perform well is something that, that will resonate back for them. So there, there, it, it really does matter how you perform it. And that's why the interaction of internship and formal language support around the edges in the small groups or with the tutors is extraordinarily important. It seems that the internship generates a need for diagnostics and training of a sort that you didn't have until you went into that. Um, there was a young man, uh, and I won't say from where, but I was visiting Nanjing, uh, who told me that he, his internship was to be the assistant to a very successful private Chinese executive, a man in his 35, age 35, 40 who was on planes constantly and was doing fabulously well, and his job was to be the sort of the number two that dealt with that man's calendar and all his appointments. He was the man that had to call an expectant colleague and explain, I'm so sorry, the president had hoped to meet with you today, but alas, he's been called away to this other meeting. And you can see in, 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 in Chinese culture that business of sort of a third of what he did was telling people, no, uh, in, in, in many different ways, but you've got to know who you're talking to in order to do that. And so we sort of looked at this sort of uh, the, the burden on it. And, and I said, well, how did you handle that? I mean, when, and he said, I, I couldn't have done it without the support of my teacher, uh, that otherwise I know I wasn't doing it right without that. So that relationship between language support and serious internship is sort of a very important design feature as far as I can see. You don't want to assume that when they get to level three, they no longer need any training. In fact, they need it more than ever, uh, because now it really matters. <laughs> it's a difficult topic. Uh, the other thing is that uh, recently we started uh, having Turkish Cypriot students in the university which is quite surprising and quite brave on their side because they have very good universities in the north. So they take you know, the decision to come to our side and to be this small minority. Um, it, depends, it depends on the lecturers, but there is no official uh, policy on that. I do know that um, there are scholarships given to them so that as it's an extra incentive to come to a university, but we thought with my colleague exactly that Turkish Cypriot students in our instit institution have no voice, that it would be interesting to go on with the research and interview them. And I'm sure that it mustn't be very positive what we will hear. But it is a taboo topic to, um, to approach with my Greek Cypriot students, especially as I disagree with the um, uh, the majority perspective. Yes, um, yes, thanks a lot. It's, it's, it's quite interesting. Um, we only have um, a student affairs um, office that helps international students with uh, finding accommodation, finding jobs, uh, and uh, other issues. But again, well, and home students as well. But I mean, it's international students that have more of a problem to find a job or to find accommodation or as they reported in this uh, in these interviews you know they get a contract from uh, for, a, for a flat and they don't even understand the contract because it's in Greek there is nobody there to translate for them so I think that what emerges is that yes they have they need more support the Chinese student, just you know, as an anecdote, the Chinese student who reported on this discrimination incident with her lecturer, who was not necessarily Greek Cypriot, we don't know who it was, who told her, if you don't speak good English, why did you come here? She sent us an email to thank us and say thank you because it was the first time that somebody gave me the chance to express myself. 
and to say these things. Yeah. So, so word for word, word for word. So I guess ultimately the question is what, uh, specifically the University of Arizona, but what role the university can play um, in providing students with these, these potentially critical or valuable resources while they're abroad. Um, at this point in time, the U of A, uh, we haven't done a lot with that. Uh, simply because we haven't, this course this has happened two semesters. One semester we had the support of the director of the study abroad office. This past semester it was me, a doctoral student. Um, but I think that's, that is the future. Um, one, one area where I think that that's starting to be addressed uh, very seriously is the cultural mentor, the idea of the cultural mentor and Michael Vandenberg's uh, work with CIEE. Um, and, and the idea that, the, that there could be a person abroad, whether it's, whether it's an island program or, or someone who's potentially available to a student online, um, someone that can help the student process things. And, okay, if you're getting into the area of psychological issues, that might be out of the realm of, say, a foreign language teacher who's sitting online at home trying to help someone in, you know, dealing with a cultural issue. But the idea is, you know, can we, can we connect? And, and I, you know, I don't know anything about, you know, the, the interworkings of what, what happens when students are, are abroad and, and the, the feasibility of, of connecting them. Um, just because I'm sure that there's a lot of issues of, well, you're not paying tuition per se, so you don't have this access. But that, that is a question. How do you, how do you, uh, how do you get that? Um, and, and maybe, you know, those island programs have, have more uh, resources uh, at, at their disposal. Um, but the idea of the cultural mentor, I think, is the closest thing that I could come up with that is that person who is who's there to deal on a day-to-day -day basis or, you know, week-to-week -week basis with those, those critical incidents that may happen very, very early on. Okay, <laughs> so the question is whether or not the course is required or if it's just, uh, just available. As of right now, it is just a, um, an, an optional course that you can take that's part of the general education requirement. Um, I think it, it, they've renamed things. It used to be individuals in society, specifically at the U of A, um, and now it's renamed something else. Uh, but essentially, it's, 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 avail it's an available elective that students can take. And I think what happens a lot of times is students see study abroad, um, probably about 80% see study abroad and say, oh, I'm interested in study abroad. I have studied abroad. This looks interesting. And the other 20% are just freshmen who are coming in and need a class. And just it's an open it's an open class. I want to get this requirement fulfilled my freshman year. Done. Yeah. As of right now, the course is not uh, directly aligned with any sort of pre uh, pre language courses. However, um, as I said, this is this is offered through the Department of German Studies. And so what we're working to do is uh, in creating this as a as a truly hybrid and then a completely online format. Um, taking some of the modules and adding linguistic German modules into them. So someone who is ideally studying abroad in Germany for a semester or a year would be able to uh, to take this class. And there's there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, a bureaucratic tape that we have to jump through for this. But that the student abroad would have access uh, to some linguistic uh, to uh, to essentially a language teacher and lang uh, language um, input while they're abroad. And yeah, I see. Yeah. Yeah, to a certain extent, this is, isn't quite exactly what you're getting at, but to a certain extent with the student presentations, uh, we do deal with that because we allow students, there's a certain amount of flexibility in what students present. Uh, so for example, I have students who were interested in uh, German, one who had had, I think, a semester or two of German, and for the German speakers in here, there's a short film called Schwarzfahrer, which essentially translated as Black Rider, but it's also, it's a play on words because it means that you are riding without a ticket. And it deals a lot with uh, cultural stereotypes. So that's something that, say, for example, a student who might be going to Germany could deal with. Um, but absolutely, I, the, the, the potential is there. It hasn't really happened as, uh, as of yet. Something that could happen potentially if this were a uh, completely pre uh, class is that for each individual assignment, or not necessarily each individual assignment, but there could be specific assignments where students have to research, OK, uh, I'm going to, one student is going to China, one student is going to Jordan, one student is going to Namibia. Uh, what is the university system like there? Well, how are classes organized? Um, can I find anybody who's already studied abroad there that I can get experience from? So those are things that are certainly in the thought process. Um, it just ends the, the, the final acceptance or not of, of that particular activity. 
uh, would be then the format of the class itself.